Good evening and welcome to our first Reading for Life lecture. Reading for Life is a movement of imagination for the purpose of growing community around a shared love of literature. The idea is that real community begins and ends with our imaginations and a few resources, if any, as a vital to the imagination's development as works of literature. I just want to let everyone know if you have any questions during the lecture, please write them in the chat box and we will have a question and answer session to follow the presentation. And I just want to give a little introduction to our presenter tonight, Michael Verde. Michael graduated with the honors from the University of Texas Plan II Honors Program and earned an MA in Literary Studies from the University of Iowa. He holds an MA in the theology from the University of Durham, England, where he graduated at the top of his international class. He taught for 15 years at the university, college prep school levels, uh, mostly at Indiana University, and is currently completing his PhD with a focus on liter literary and religion studies. Michael founded Reading for Life in 2005. Tonight, our topic will be To Kill a Mockingbird by Har Harper Lee. Uh, do you want to take it from there, Michael? Courtney, thank you. And thank the Austin, Minnesota Library in, in general for the vision and the tenacity. You know, a lot of people have big ideas and not necessarily are able to do the follow through that makes ideas come to fruition. So I want to thank the library both for its vision and for its commitment to following through on an idea. Uh, goodness, eight podcast, four books, one year, uh, and you. Those are the ingredients of this Reading for Life adventure. The idea around which, as Courtney mentioned, is that works of art, and in this case, literary works of art, can be a focus and therefore a locus of community. You know, one of the things that sets literature apart from other kinds of prose is that works of fiction bring bring to life primary concerns. And I say primary to make a distinction between those things that we share by virtue of being human and living in a particular material universe, we have certain needs and desires that cut across whatever demographics that we might occupy. These concerns can be distinguished from secondary concerns. And here's the difference, and I wanna just call attention to these because literature animates primary concerns, and that gives us an opportunity to talk and get to see how each of us relate to primary concerns. So for instance, primary concern, food, water, shelter, intimacy, freedom of movement. These are needs and desires of persons irrespective of where he or she may come from, even across time. Secondary concerns tend to be those ways that we identify ourselves with particular affiliations. So it could be religious, could be political, could be ideological in some other way. And I say those are concerns and important concerns, but I'm distinguishing those secondary concerns from these primary concerns uh, that are biological and that are also, uh, you could say, involves consciousness. So food and water for the body turns out to be food for thought, for the mind or freedom of movement of the body it would be the liberty of expression and of intellectual exploration. In any case, the idea around this series is that because works of literature bring primary concerns to the foreground, then we can assemble ourselves around this locus of community and conversation and perhaps find that we have some a, a common ground with respect to primary concerns that we might not share at the level of secondary concerns. Uh, in any case, that's the idea. It's very appropriate. Real quick, I don't know if you can see me because I'm seeing a blank screen, but in any case, I'll leave that to Courtney and the team. Uh, it's very, I think, appropriate, opposite, in fact, that we should start this adventure with To Kill a Mockingbird. Because arguably, and in this case, plausibly, arguably, this is the most popular novel ever written in English. Uh, to date, something like 55 million copies of this novel has been sold. It's been translated in over 40 uh, languages. It is a common staple in high school curriculum. And in addition to uh, uh, vex fitful prom night and um, misadventures in the hallways, To Kill a Mockingbird may be the most common shared imaginative experience of high school students in the United States. Uh, 
1991 Library of Congress in a survey, the prompt of which, which books have made the greatest difference in your life? The number one choice uh, actually, the number two choice was To Kill a Mockingbird. The, the number one choice was the Bible. In 1999, the librarians of the United States through the Library Journal uh, determined that this, or decided rather, that this was the greatest novel of the century. And as recently as 2006, the librarians in England, uh, when asked uh, what is the one book a person should read before he or she dies, to Kill a Mockingbird actually this time finished first and the Bible second. Its impact cuts across genres. In 1963, Academy Award winning, in fact, three Academy Award winning films. 2018, the Broadway production of To Kill a Mockingbird, which has now had the highest grossing sales of any play in American history. When the uh, second Harper Lee novel, or perhaps more accurately, the first draft of Kill a Mockingbird was uh, released in 2014, Go Set a Watchman. It broke Barnes and Noble's records for the greatest amount of uh, book sales on the opening day. In the first week, I think it sold something like 1. million copies. And Amazon pre-order sales for Go Set a Watchman toppled all its previous records. When you have a work of art that attracts this much devotion, really, because this is a book that people not only like and not only love, this is the kind of book, as one of the surveys uh, indicated, that people are inclined to say, this book changed my life. And when you have a work that is having that kind of impact over that amount of time through diversity of settings, you're dealing with something that people are identifying with at at least two levels. Certainly, there is many personal reasons why people are attracted to the book as there are people. You might, for instance, identify with the book because you were a tomboy, or perhaps you grew up in a, a small town and maybe even a, a, a southern small town that on the outside looked sleepy, or as Jim described it, like a caterpillar in a cocoon that was warm but not yet entirely born. This is Jim's metaphor. Perhaps you grew up in a town like that and that attracts you to the book. Or perhaps it's Atticus's sort of steadfast commitment to a certain uh, morality or ethical uh, code to which one doesn't, um, one doesn't relinquish even in the face of objection, even in the face perhaps of derision. Perhaps those are reasons why different people with different kind of life paths would identify with the book. But certainly when you're talking about over 55 million people, you can't only explain its appeal through those idiosyncratic connections. And it is the source, the, the universal, you might say, uh, the universal magic of this book. Why is it that this many people over this amount of time are drawn to this book with this degree of zeal? That is the question I kind of want to ask myself and explore with you. What might be that universal dimension of this book? So that's that's our uh, angle of engagement. And I, I think a good place to start would be with uh, uh, Jim's experiences in the sixth grade. Jim, as you know, is the brother of Scout. Scout is the principal protagonist. When the book opens, she's six years old. Uh, in Makeham, Alabama, this the narrator is the older scout looking back on her life starting at the age of six. It's said that the book is based roughly on Harper Lee's experience in, in Monroe, Alabama, roughly between 1933 and 1935. In any case, Jim says to Scout, because Scout is expressing some real dissatisfaction with even the whole idea of school, which is not proven to be uh, particularly generative for her. He says to Scout not to worry because you don't really learn anything important in school until you get to the sixth grade. Um, I'm not sure that that was the case for, for me. Uh, I had some important things happen earlier that, but I can't remember anything particularly in the sixth grade. Uh, but in any case, that's what Jim's uh, vision was for Scout and her pedagogical trajectory. And the reason it turns out that sixth grade was uh, a threshold year in Jim's intellectual life is because in the sixth grade in Miss Blunt's class, Jim learned about the pyramids of Egypt 
and in particular, the caste system of Egypt. And this historical introduction to a social structure in a place far away in time and geography served Jim as a kind of, let's say, filter or lens through which he had a new perspective on Makem and in particular Makem's social structure. Social structure, we use this structure as a metaphor, thinking of architecture and things that are physical, but a social structure, of course, is not visible in the same way a structure of an edifice might be. And so to get a sense of it uh, requires a different kind of vision than what the eyes alone will empirically reveal. So with the, the cons construct of the Egyptian caste system, which placed the pharaoh at the top, the slaves at the bottom, and the courtiers, let's say one strata below the pharaoh and on down the line. With this construct, Jim was able to see that, you know what? It looks like Makem, our town, also has a caste system. And it becomes a source of intellectual uh, inquiry on Jim's part to try to flesh out what the different social classes are, hierarchically arranged in Makem that would be in some way parallel to those hierarchical arrangements of Egypt. And he engages Scout in this conversation and they propose different kinds of theories of why what particular person is here or there on this social pyramid. At the end of the day, uh, Jim proposes this. He says, I figured it out, Scout. In our caste system, or our pyramid, at the top are the white people like us, the Finches. One rung beneath us are the white people like the Cunninghams who live in the woods. Beneath the Cunninghams, Jim hypothesizes, are the Yules who live down by the dump. And beneath the Yules in our social structure of Makem are the, are the Negroes. This is the terminology in, in the novel itself. And this is Jim's way of making a kind of analogous um, assessment of the way people in Makem organize themselves in ways that are not visible to the naked eye, but that manifest themselves in all kinds of events. And the novel brings the camera in to close focus on how the pyramid operates in the minds of Macomians in two principal settings. The first setting is that of the jurors in the trial of Tom Robinson. Tom Robinson is accused by uh, Bob Yule of raping his daughter. And there is a trial and uh, the judge of the make them appoints Atticus to defend Tom Robinson. And in this trial, the jurors are, they are presented with two narratives. They of course weren't at the scene of the incident. So they have no way of knowing through a firsthand conviction what in fact has happened and are relying on two narratives that they're proposed to them to decide what in fact transpired between Mayel Yule and Tom Robinson. In one narrative, uh, the narrative uh, proposed by the prosecution, uh, it is in keeping with what Bob Yule has claimed that his daughter was accosted and subsequently raped by this black man. But Atticus presents an alternative narrative that the jurors are asked to, to consider. And in Atticus's presentation, it is in fact Mayella Yule who sexually accosts Tom Robinson. And there is some reason, some in fact irrefutable reasons why it was physically impossible for Tom Robinson to have beaten and raped Mayella Yule. And that particular anatomical reason was because Tom Robinson's left arm, which was shorter than his right, was not, uh, it, 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 the arm was not functional. And it turned out that it is the right side of Mayella Yule's face that is bruised and shows that it has been struck multiple times. It also turns out that Mayella Yule's father, Bob Yule, is left-handed. So the arm that 
uh, Tom Robinson can't use. And the side of the face that that arm would have struck turns out to be the side of the face that Bob Buell's lead hand was actually uh, functional. So there is some reasons that are irrefutable reasons, you would think, that Tom Robinson could not have done what he's accused to do. Nevertheless, the jurors are presented with those two, with that two different narratives. Now, I will, I'm trying to flesh out how this pyramid works, how this caste system manifests itself in the way people make sense, in this case, interpret two proposals of, a, of a, an actual event. The fact that the jurors, despite physically irrefutable evidence, the fact that the jurors come back and render a verdict of guilty to Tom Robinson illustrates how the pyramid functions in real time. Because what essentially this case turned on was this question. Could a white woman be sexually attracted to a black man? And according to the pyramid, if Mayella Yule occupies the third strata on this social hierarchy and African-American people are beneath her, then it is not imaginable. And the key word here is imaginable. It's not imaginable given the pyramid or caste system that the jurors of Makem have internalized. In other words, they're not really rendering a verdict on what happened in real time between these actual people. The verdict is actually saying that in Makem, this pyramid is not malleable. This pyramid and its structure is not up for negotiation. And whatever may or may not be happen in the quote unquote real world, what is most real to us is this social structure. And we are going to keep this social structure. Now, these are not things that people say consciously. And nevertheless, it is as Atticus to Jim after the, the children are despondent because they know that, that in, a gross injustice has been carried out. And they're, uh, they're not only despondent about the, the, the case itself, their entire sense of the world as a place that makes sense, where there are things called justice and right and wrong, all of those kinds of things that they took for granted in their state of innocence. Because of this event, that has been shattered. In many ways now they're walking around in a world that they had previously never imagined existed and they have seen its ugly face and are distraught understandably about it. And Atticus explains to Jim that in a situation as that of a black man uh, accused of raping a white woman, that those jurors simply were not rendering a verdict based on reason. As he says to Jim, something came between their mind and reason. And what I'm proposing came between their mind and reason is this particular caste system that then manifested itself in the verdict that they rendered. That is one context where you see the caste system in play and, and how it manifests itself. A second setting in which this caste is on uh, full display would be the missionary circle. This is the group of ladies. And you can see the binary structure here. It is the men who are in the setting of the jury box. It is the women who are in the setting of the missionary circle. And in this missionary circle, and we wanna keep an eye on that word circle. In the setting of the circle, the, the ladies and led by Miss Grace Merriweather, the most, uh, the most moral person, and at this point, Scout is being uh, openly ironic. Uh, the most moral woman of Makem is um, expressing really her, her fatigue at the fact that the African-American people are being surly about the verdict. And she suggests to the other ladies that they need to keep in mind that they should forgive the African-American people, or she calls them the, the, the darkies. They should forgive the darkies uh, for their attitude at the moment, because that's the Christian thing to do. So this, again, is exemplifying the way that people 
are assigned different strata and the way reality is interpreted through the lens of that social structure. One of the things that we learn about Anne Alexandra is that she is, in addition to being the amanuensis of the missionary circle, which is to say two things, she is the secretary and the memory. That's what amanuensis suggests, that Anne Alexandra is the memory of the missionary circle. She, Anne Alexandra is also has this peculiar gift of knowing everyone in Maycomb according to the tribe to which he or she belongs. And not only does she know what everyone's tribal affiliation is, she knows what the particular uh, distinguishing characteristic about that tribe, and it is always a disreputable characteristic that she refers to as a streak. So this particular tribe of people or family, they have a, a flighty streak. Or this group, in the case of, of, of Gertrude Farrow and the Farrow they have a drinking streak, for instance. Well, Anne Alexandra knows every group by their tribal name, and she knows what it is about that group that has determined its place on a social hierarchy. This conversation that takes place in the context of a missionary circle are just so many ways that through gossip, that pyramid is assigning through the imagination of the participants everyone's rightful place in the social hierarchy and um, more fundamentally and perhaps perver perversely because it is the missionary circle this social strata that has been shown to be exploitive demeaning indeed in the case of tom robinson deadly this social structure is positioned as something sanctioned by God himself. In this way, then the people who are themselves identifying with the pyramid are not responsible because God has a So the missionary circle, in other words, is using uh, religion to sanctify and to legitimate the particular structure that keeps everyone in Maycomb in his or her place, principally through gossip. To, to, to demonstrate just how upside down this is, Grace Merriweather, in addition to talking about the darkies and make them being a surly, uh, tells the story about a great missionary, Methodist missionary, J. Everett Grimes. And she met J. Everett Grimes at a church revival, at, I guess a church camp, before he went back to Africa to save the Maruna people. This is apparently a, a tribe of people in Africa, Harper Lee, it's not based on an actual people in Africa. She made up the, the name Marunas. Uh, but Grace Merriweather explains that J. Everett Grimes is such a, he's such a good man that he has dedicated his life to saving the Maruna people. And these people she described are remarkably primitive. And as she gives the details of their lives, the ladies are listening aghast at, at a people that could be uh, so uncivilized. And the way the Marunas live, according to Grace Merriweather, they all, to eat and drink, they all chew the bark of a common tree. Uh, they then go and spit into a pot, and they drink together out of this pot. She describes this as, as, as a ritual and a practice that is distinctive of the Maruna people as an example of just how uncivilized, unchristian they in fact are. The point I want to underscore though in this context is how this pyramid, not only has it been the lens through which the jurors have rendered their verdict about something they didn't see in person, it, that same pyramid now is being projected across the, the entire world, as these ladies in the missionary circle imagine it, exist according to this pyramid structure that they just happen to be close to the apex of. And not only is, do they have a, this privileged place in the social pyramid, it is a pyramid that God himself has a decree or created. This is an example of... And I bring all this up because our big um, inquiry here, or our kind of essay of sorts, is what could be the universal appeal of this novel? And my guess is that most people 
understand that pyramid and how it works rather intuitively. Because if you're like me, you've encountered this social pyramid through many instances and perhaps, perhaps maybe the majority of your social life. When I look back on junior high and high school and even elementary school, I can very well see a, a kind of social pyramid in which different people were said to be along to this group. They were the athletes. They were the geeks. They were the nerds. And then there were the people who smoked or did other kinds of things that were uh, scandalous. And they all carried these reputations throughout their life. Well, what were we doing? We were putting people in, in their place in a social hierarchy. In fact, this is a, a kind of uh, structure that is not only, we could say, endemic to people and not, not universal because there's no reason to conclude that people have always and at all times organized themselves in social pyramids. In fact, there's evidence of, of people not organizing themselves in that way. Nevertheless, it does seem to be pervasive and not only within the human species, but also among uh, animals and mammals and particularly primates. I took a class at the University of Texas on primate behaviors. We studied uh, Sykes and vervet monkeys, and they organized themselves in a social pyramid. And I remember as I learned this, and we did actual observation, it's sort of maybe like Jim hit me right between the eyes. Oh, my goodness. Uh, this monkey business is very much people business. So that's a way and reason, I believe, that this novel, beneath perhaps the conscious surface, we can identify with the idea that people identify themselves in kinds of caste. But this novel is not an ironic novel. It's not a satire. It's not a tragedy. It doesn't end, in other words, with the pyramid getting the last word. Uh, there's another social structure that manifests itself, but not as obviously in the novel. And I want to propose what the images are in the novel that give us a glimpse of what it would mean to live off of the pyramid. And I think there's two principal images. The first, perhaps you remember that on a, a day out of nowhere, snow comes to make them and the whole town school is let out because it never snows in make them. And on this uh, day out of school, uh, day out of school, uh, Jim decides that, that this snow could be put to good use by making a snowman. However, the snow is so minimal that Jim is not able to gather enough to, to make a, a snowman. So he supplements his snow with the soil, the dirt there in, in his yard. And he begins to put these together, this snowman, part snow and part dirt. And initially he's using as his model, one of his neighbors named Mr. Avery. But as he completes this snowman, it looks so much like Mr. Avery that the uh, kids decide, or perhaps Atticus is, admonishes them, that they would be mocking Mr. Avery. And so they decided that they would incorporate Miss Maudie, their next their across the street neighbor, in this uh, snowman's uh, manifestation. And so they go across to Miss Maudie's house and they, they gather her, I think, her clippers and one of her hats. She's a big gardener. And they incorporate this into the snowman. And, and anyway, when they finish this snowman from across the street, Miss Maudie hollers to the kids, to Jim and Scout, you've created an absolute morphodite. Now, to my knowledge, morphodite is a neologism. In other words, uh, uh, Harper Lee, as far as I can tell, made up this word. It's a very interesting word. It sounds a little bit like hermaphrodite. It certainly, through the morph, uh, emphasizes the body and the morphing or the trans -morph transformation, the morphing of a body. This absolute morphodite, uh, if we were to imagine how it is constituted. Well, first of all, it is part white. It is part black because of the snow and because of the, the dirt. It is part male, part female, part natural, part artificial. In other words, the absolute morphodite is a combination of things that are seemingly opposite, that seemingly should be in discrete place, have been brought together in a common place and out of those ingredients, a human body has been created. I'm suggesting that this is an image that can be contrasted with a social pyramid. That in the social pyramid, everyone has his or her place and those things don't intermingle. They don't cross borders. 
but in the absolute morphodi, all things come together to be one thing and no one thing is superior to another thing. That's one image of what the pyramid could be contrasted with. Another image going back to those Marunas. Very, very interesting, the, these Marunas and their relationship to a tree and of a, a common source of sustenance. And here's why I think it's interesting. If you think a little bit about what these Marunas are doing, perhaps you remember the movie Avatar and the Navi people and their relationship to a tree and the way uh, uh, they were all in some sense finding the source of their life in this common tree. The Maruna people, you might say, are doing something in their rituals that if you think about it, looks, and here's the irony of the missionary circle, looks a whole lot like communion. I mean, if for someone were to come from a, another planet to visit a, a church where communion was being offered and someone was to explain what was happening, uh, it would be something like, well, you see, uh, that bread there is, is the body of these people's God. And that wine, well, that's the blood of these people's God. And what they're doing is they're eating that body and then they're drinking that blood. That, I guess, would be, well, if you think about that, it's starting to sound not unlike what the Marunas are doing, of finding a, 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 a way both in actual practice and perhaps imaginatively and symbolically to remember, as an RE hyphen member, remember through this common source of sustenance. Remember, I mentioned that there's our primary concerns of food, but then those primary concerns can modulate into, you could say, existential or spiritual concerns so that the food for the body can also be a food, a soul food, you might say. And what these Maroons are doing is they're organizing themselves not in a nuclear family, as is the case in Makem. And this is what has the ladies of the missionary circle so convinced it's not civilized because only the nuclear family, according to this pyramidal structure, could be considered uh, God sanctioned. These people are living. And what are they doing? They are becoming one body that is not characterized by tribal distinctions and a social hierarchy. In other words, the absolute morphodite, which Jim and Scout make, and the Maruna people are other structures that contrast or can be contrasted with the caste system. How, you might ask, does one move from living within a caste system to living otherwise, particularly if you're in the middle of a town like that? Uh, this, you might say, is the deep plot of the novel. The principal plot, of course, is bringing out this character named Boo Radley to coax Boo Radley from coming out of his house. A deeper plot might be, will Scout and Jim assimilate the pyramid, the pyramid that has played itself out in the juror box in the missionary circle? Will they internalize that? Will it become their mind structure, so to speak, their frame of reference? Or will they uh, be delivered from the social structure of Macon? Will they get outside of it and imagine a different way of being human? This, you might say, is the subtextual plot of the novel. And I want to propose with a little bit of time that we have left. A very here's a wonderful scene. As you know, when Scout and Jim return from the high school from their celebration of the Halloween party and, and pageant, which combined on the same night, Scout is wearing a ham. Scout is dressed as a ham for Halloween. And she and Jim, when they're coming home, are attacked by Bob Buell, who's going to get his revenge on Atticus for humiliating him in the trial, because Atticus has exposed the fact that, in fact, he has sexually molested his daughter. Everyone knew that, whether or not they would, have, whether they would agree to it in public or not. And in retribution to Atticus, Bob Buell is going to kill his children. I have multiple times, if you have your protagonist in what can be considered the climax, the action climax of the novel, dressed as a ham, if ever there was a moment in which something was blinking in red neon lights, this is a symbol. 
Well, this would be the moment when your main character, whose life or death situation is dressed as a ham, you, you're going to have to come to terms with what in the world is that ham symbolized? Because if it's clearly, if, even if we were going to say that Halloween it had to be, why be dressed as a ham? I I don't recall any of my friends or myself ever dressing. I do. I can see Casper, the friendly ghost, Spider Man, Frankenstein, witches, uh, angels, fairies. I don't remember any hams. Well, I, that perplexed me for a long time until I learned through some kind of uh, reading and all of a sudden I learned that the land of Egypt was known by the Hebrew people as the land of Ham. And when that came to my awareness, then all of the imagery related to Egypt in the novel, including the fact that the sixth grade, Jim entered his Egyptian period. Scout says he began to walk stiffly like a stork imitating and make fun of, making fun of him. And then all of a sudden, Aunt Alexandra, why Aunt Alexandra? Well, that's associated with, with Egypt. Uh, and then uh, it started to occur to me that there was something going on that looked very much like the Exodus story taking place in this novel. Uh, Northrop Fry, the great literary mind of the 20th century, uh, proposed that all works of literature evolved out of myth. Certainly in this novel, if you scratch the surface, you can see that the myth of Exodus is playing itself out in a novel context. To come out of the ham, in other words, is to come out of the mentality, to come out of the mindset of a caste. This is the moment in which Scout is delivered from the mentality, symbolically the moment in which she comes out of this caste system that has and, and really body snatched the people of make. She's coming out of that social structure into a new kind of consciousness. And it's not long after she's saved by Boo Radley that Boo Radley escorts Scout back to the Radley house. He, in fact, leads her. She insists that he is the lead as he walks her down the street. Their arms are locked together, hooked together, almost as if it was a, a marriage ceremony. When she enters the Radley gate, she says it was the second time in her life she had entered the Radley yard. The first time is when she came rolling in a tire. It was a game that she and Jim and Dill were playing. They put her in a tire and they rolled her. In this instance, rolled her too hard. And she rolled right into the Radley yard and hit up against the porch. Well, this was the second time that she had entered the Radley yard. She goes to the front door and Boo Radley walks into the house and she remarks, and I never saw him again. Now, at this point, a scout is nine years old, maybe 10 years old, and she it's not plausible that the person that just saved her life, because it doesn't say that Boo Radley died. It just says that she was to never see him again. And so I knew that there was something to be thought through there. Uh, after he, Boo Radley steps into the house, she walks over to the window, the window at which Boo Radley has been standing throughout the novel, watching the children and watching make them. That's perhaps the basis of Go Set a Watchman because Boo Radley is the watchman of Maker. Well, she stands at the window and she has Boo Radley's perspective now on the town. Here's the moment. Remember that Atticus told her, if you learn one simple trick, Scout, you'll get along a lot better with people. That simple trick was to see the world from their eyes and he described it metaphorically as to climb into their skin and perhaps for them to climb into your skin. Well, this... I'm going to suggest is precisely what has happened here. When Scout comes out of the ham, Boo Radley enters into Scout. She never sees, excuse me, Scout never sees Boo again, because from here on out, she will see with Boo. She won't see Boo. Boo will, in fact, be her eyes. She's had an eye transplant, so to speak. And as she's standing at that window, she describes Makem and very interesting about the description, and we can wrap up with this. She sees Makem in four seasons simultaneously. She sees Makem, in other words, not in ordinary time. She's no longer in clock time. She's in some other kind of dimension of time in which all things are present. And she sees how every facet of Makem is drawn together. And what brings them together 
you, if you read this, this moment when a scout is describing what she sees from the Radley window, and I'm hypothesizing with Boo's eyes, she begins by seeing uh, moments from the past. They're now made present. And as she begins to describe these moments, it initially starts out that she is seeing Atticus as her father and as Jim's father. And this is his children, and the his is referring the pronoun to Atticus in the first several uh, vignettes that she describes. But by the last vignette, you read this scene carefully, the pronoun his, as is his and her father, the his of the his of his children modulates or migrates from Atticus to Boo Radley. So by the final vista, the father and his children are Scout and Jim. The implication would be that Boo Radley, who after all is named after a ghost, who's described as so translucently white, you could almost see through him, whose hair is described as that of a bird, who's initially, uh, when Jim challenges, when Deal challenges Jim the first time to go touch the house, he says, I'll trade you one gray ghost for two Tom Swifts. He's saying, if you'll go touch the Radley house, I'll give you this book, The Gray Ghost. There's another ghost. And then two Tom Swifts, there's another bird. If you see, in other words, if you read the novel, uh, Boo Radley is through images identified with both a ghost and a bird. In effect, then, this spirit, this, you could say, speaking of Casper, this Holy Ghost, as Scout has experienced it, is something that is potentially within everyone in Maker. In other words, uh, just as the Maroonas are having a common source of sustenance from that tree, it's quite possible, and this brings us now to Boo's tree, and remember the first gift from the tree? What was it? It was chewing gum with the Mig Wrigley Double Mint wrapper taken off, chewing gum. Remember now the Maroonas chewing that bark? Well, here is Scout, the first gift that she gets from the tree is something to chew. She, in effect, that tree that Scout receives and Jim receives these gifts from Boo is analogous, you could say, or identified with this tree of the Maroona. And it is a source of life. It is the gifts that come down are all gifts to images to lead Scout and Jim out of the caste system of Maycomb. And I'm suggesting that the way you make an absolute morphodite amongst real people is that they share a common spirit, not that they become uniform, that they have rather unity with maximum diversity. Remember the morphodite is difference, differences coming together, uh, not everyone being the same. So in other words, if we're sharing something, you could say spiritually or imaginatively, that brings us together, we get the best of both worlds of being uniquely who we are, singularly who we are, including in all the ways that are not common. And yet at the same time, we don't have to fragment out into balkanized little identity spaces because we do share a kind of common body, metaphorically speaking. In any case, I want to conclude by saying the reason I believe we're drawn to this novel and the reason it has such universal or universal-like appeal is because we can feel the reality of both that caste system or social pyramid and the reality of being a part of other bodies so that my skin encapsulated ego is not really the limits of who I am because Part of who I am is in you, and part of who you are is in me. And when I come to identify with you, or as Attica says, see the world through your eyes, then we have walked away, walked out of, in fact, the pyramid or the caste system that we are typically identified with. I wish that we had more time uh, to, to discuss this because we barely scratched the surface, but we do have a little time for questions that may have been proffered to one of our facilitators, and I'll take what time's left to, to share with you what thoughts, and perhaps it's not a question, it's a comment, but whatever, this is a space now that we can begin to unpack and what I've shared, you just, it's Walt Whitman said, if I said something that uh, insults your soul, just dismiss it. That's the great thing about literature. There's no right or wrong answer, but we can come together as if we're chewing from a common tree, this time a book, and we can see what we can uh, internalize from each other's perspective. So I'm, I'm open for questions, whatever folks want to do now.
I see Courtney's uh, popping back in. I did. Yep. I unmuted myself. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to type them in the chat and I can relay those to Michael or any comments you're looking that you would like to share about the presentation or the reading itself. Don't be shy. It's, uh, it's just us talking through things. Uh, while I'm waiting for a question, I'll just, just for fun, point out some kind of random things. Uh, Tom Robinson, I mentioned the possibility of Boo Radley being in different people in that sense, then in each person, in addition to their human beingness, each person it, it could be associated with a bird. Now, not in every case, but in many. Mr. Avery, the Finches, Tom Robinson, or son of a robin. Uh, in many instances, you'll see bird imagery associated with people. What kind of dog is it? The, the mad dog that comes to town that Atticus uh, shoots? It's a bird dog. Remember the Gray Ghost book? Well, it's written by Secretary Hawkins. Secretary spelled S-E-C-K-T-A-R-Y, Hawkins. Turns out there's a secretary bird, and of course there's a hawk. Tom Swift, well, that's another bird. There's birds and ghosts everywhere. Last randomly cool thing, uh, it is the left side of the body that is associated with death in this novel. It is Atticus is partially blind in his left eye. When Jim is injured in the assault by Bob Buell, it's his left arm that's permanently injured and now it's conspicuously shorter than his right arm. It is Tom Robinson's left arm that is crippled. It is Bob Buell's left hand that beats his daughter. And when Atticus shoots the bird dog, he hits him above the left eye. We know this because the text says that Sheriff Heck Tate, when he walks over to the dog, points to where Atticus hit the dog and it's right above his left eye. This is the way that novels communicate in images. And just as there's a tree of life and a tree of death, where in this novel, there's a, a side metaphorically that is the side of death and the side of life. Okay, if I see there's some chats. I'm all ears. I guess I sort of have a little bit of a comment while I'm waiting for some to come through on the chat that I think is interesting about sort of the story and the tying in with it is how the narrator is a child. And it sort of goes through what makes me come to think a little bit about, you know, correlation with the Bible as they talked about disciplines of Matthew. And they said, become like little children. And sort of the way that story was told um, through a child's eyes to make it a little bit, for me, a little bit easier for the reader to sort of accept what that character was going through of seeing the injustice and the hurting, the oppression of people. I guess those were some correlations that I sort of, you know, listening to your lecture and also reading the book sort of put together in my mind. Yeah, that seems insightful. There's certainly associating association with innocence. And the innocence collision, abrupt collision with experience, the world, in other words, of innocence, or in William Blake, the world of the lamb. And then there's the world of the tiger. And the question is, once we come from this world of innocence, and we do have this awakening to the world of experience, is that the end of the story? In other words, can there be a kind of second, not childish, but childlike, but this second kind of child nature would be one that has not oblivious to experience. In other words, now we're, we're not in the dark about the, the ways of the world that are exploitive, that are demeaning, and that even are, are, are potentially genocidal in its most, the grossest expressions. Now we're aware of those things. And yet there is still something about us that has participated in another reality in which the pyramid doesn't get the last word. In other words, we know about the pyramid and yet uh, we're not of it. Or as one book put it, you're uh, 
in the world, but you're not of it. This second child nature would be a kind of second birth in, in which we've uh, risen above what seems to be the status quo, but we're not oblivious or naive about it. The novel begins with a, a little epigraph to Charles Lamb, who said that lawyers must have been children once. And very clearly, the novelist is playing around with the distinction between the law, which is associated in the uh, Hebrew and Christian Bibles, uh, the law is associated with a kind of a source of authority. And then in the New Testament, that is contrasted with love as another source of authority with the idea that, that love is a wider circle of circumference than what the law can recognize. Uh, so I think then that the child dimension that you're talking about could map on to these worlds of innocence and experience. And then you could say a post-experience innocence that is not oblivious to the law or even breaking the law, but that answers to something that the law itself cannot necessarily hear and certainly can't respond to with the kind of adroitness and creative form that a fulfilling life would recommend. Guys, this is my first time to interact in this kind of way with uh, folks from Minnesota. And I understand the Scandinavian background. I'm just being a little bit playful here, speaking of tribes. So maybe some of the reticence is, is a cultural difference. And maybe maybe with this accent of mine, uh, you'll have to wait for the transcript to come out to even know exactly what I said. Uh, but if there is any comments before we go, I would just I would really be interested in hearing what's percolating in people's minds. I see seven chats down there, Courtney. Or, oh, I see, I see a, a, a namaste. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate that. It's very kind. I'm not sure. But Nit, 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 Nitya, uh, she and them, thank you. That's I really do appreciate that. Yeah, we're getting great compliments back that people really enjoyed the book and the discussion on there. Um, and while we're sort of waiting, I might just give a little announcement here um, of our next meeting that we will be doing. Um, we will be reading Jane Eyre, and that will be January 13th at 6, um, along with uh, next Thursday, we are meeting at the library November 4th at 6, and that's just an open discussion. If you want to come in, discuss some more about the presentation and the book, um, we'll have some groups there where you can just come in, I know, kind of thinking about everything that we've read and listened to. So that'll be a good time for that. And maybe have a chance to reread certain sections and try on some of this imagery and see if it works for your imagination. I know I'm already thinking of so much of what you said and what I read. Now I want to go back and read some of those chapters with that point of view and well, see all, what. All reading is rereading. And let me close with this idea. Typically, when we read, we imagine that the words that we're reading correspond to something off the page that makes those words real. But in works of literature, words don't, they don't mean through correspondence, they mean through coherence. In other words, in works of literature, the words on the page, instead of pointing outward to something in the quote unquote real world, those words connect to each other and they form patterns. So what I was really doing was sharing some kind of uh, um, interpretation based on the way that the words and the imagery in the novel have come together to form a kind of gestalt. So as you're reading the next time, uh, here's what I would recommend. Uh, imagine, look for ways that this word connects to that word. For instance, Notice how many times you see the word pass. The novel begins with Jim Arm being in injured and, and Scout says, but he didn't care as long as he could pass and punt. At some point in the novel, she hollers out, pass the damn ham. When Atticus com completes the trial un unsuccessfully and is walking out of the courtroom, someone stands, says, Scout and Jim, stand your daddy's passing. You'll notice pass all over, used all over the place. Well, why is that? Well, I'm gonna suggest this goes back to the myth of Exodus. Uh, coming out of the ham would be the pass over. This is the time when the angel of the Lord was coming to inflict death on the firstborn of all the children of Egypt. And the, and the Hebrew people are enjoined to paint, to put blood on the mantle of their house. And then the angel of death would pass over. Well, what happens with Bob Yule and the children at the, at the tree? He comes as an angel of death to kill the children. And yet because of Boo, he, he passes over 
them. So this is why you'll see the verb pass. Now, those things you would never notice unless you begin to read the words as they are communicating with each other, not through the words, but the words as they connect. Give it a try and then come in next Thursday and share what it is that you've discovered by looking at the way the words are connected with each other. Well, guys, I think uh, we did it again. I want to thank the Austin, Minnesota Library, Julie, Courtney, uh, the team, and just first class. And I look forward. We've got all Christmas now and uh, in a month or so to, to read Jane Eyre uh, by Charlotte Bronte. And let's get together and see what we can uh, come up with uh, through the chewing on the bark of a common book tree. Thank you very much. And uh, See you in a few months. Thank you so much.